As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply. Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to this custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they all shouted the more, Crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they offered Jesus wine mixed with myrrh, but Jesus did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified Jesus. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with Jesus they, and with Jesus they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, Save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a spoon, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, the younger of Joseph and Salome. They used to follow him and provided for Jesus when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, 
that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that Jesus was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where their body was laid. Gracious God, as we are called together as people of God, let us not only hear your word, let us feel in our hearts the experience of the passion of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want you to give some thought to, as I start going through this, what it would have been like to experience what I just read. What would it have been like to be there on that very day? Um, we start with a parade into Jerusalem. They call this a parade of honor. In those days when there were parades like this, and you were brought in, especially on this colt, and people throwing their cloaks down, and palms being waved, and they're shouting Hosanna, that was honor. Um, I know myself coming through that door this morning uh, in the front of the crowd to begin with, I, I was just, I was almost shaking. I was so excited. It's like, wow, look at all these people. Um, I saw smiles. I heard you saying Hosanna. Um, acclamations, waving the palm branches, um, finding your place in the crowd. Had, your heads were held high. You were excited. There were smiles on your face. You came in singing, all, all glory, loud, and honor. Uh, so just think about how that felt to walk in here. That was our first gospel reading we heard about us coming into Jerusalem. Uh, and who was on the colt? Well, that's the question everybody always had. This is actually along with Palm Sunday. This is also um, the Annunciation of our Lord Sunday, which means nine months from today is when Jesus is born. And I think it's ironic that we have... You know, Gabriel, who comes to Mary, you know, and tells her that the Holy Spirit will be coming, and she will bear a child, and it will be a king and a servant. Uh, on this very day, he comes there and he tells her that. And there is excitement and hope. We have all that excitement and hope of the birth of Jesus, this infant person who is born on Christmas Day. But then we come to today, and what do we say? We say, crucify him. Crucify him. Mark's gospel, Mark's gospel talks a lot about the confusion of the disciples, the crowd, and the high priests. They think they know, but they aren't sure. On Palm Sunday, of course, they're saying, Hosanna, our king has arrived. But in a few days, if you come back to visit us, you will hear the exact opposite. Think what you heard in my gospel this morning. Crucify him. This altar will change. It will look very different. Um, it won't look like it did on Christmas morning. Um, Peter states, I do not know this man you are talking about. Peter thinks he is lying when he denies who Jesus is. However, Peter does not comprehend the true mystery of Jesus, the one who must suffer and die, the Son of God. We do not comprehend the mystery of Jesus. I just recently had my faculty interview uh, as part of my um, seminary. Not sure why I'm scratching. Um, anyway, and, and I, so you have to write an approval essay. And in the approval essay, it's about 26, 27 pages long. And it, then I go, in, I, I go in front of faculty, and I have to defend my paper to them. And one of the questions that was presented to me was, you talk about all this hope. You start your paper with, it's a mystery. You know, Jesus, God, the Holy Trinity, it's a mystery. But then you give me 25 pages telling me what that mystery is. And I said to the professor, I said, well, that's because that's what I've learned in seminary. <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said, we don't know. We don't know the mystery, but this is my best guess. And this is what I will tell the people that I preach to, is the mystery, the promise of a Jesus dying on the cross for us so we have salvation. 
I passed the interview. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> Anyway, so after we come in with our palm branches, then we have another parade. We have the parade that I talked about that you will hear about later in the week again. I think my battery is dead. Can you hear me? If I talk a little louder? Okay. Um, this parade is a parade of shame. It's, it's a, the least honorable thing that can happen to someone dying on a cross. It's the least honorable thing. But Jesus takes that journey and the death on the cross with one of humility, obedience, and emptying himself. As was written in Philippians, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Even death on a cross, the most humiliating thing that can happen. And then we have the crucifixion. He arrives at the cross. There is mocking. There is taunting. Um, Pilate asks them, why? Why do you want me to do this? Nobody even attempts to give him an answer. All they say is crucify him. Crucify him. But then, when he cries out, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They have this glimmer of hope. The crowd has a glimmer of hope that Elijah will come to save him. Jesus takes his last breath and dies. I like it what Luke says about how the earth shakes and the rocks split. And we know Mark says the curtain is torn in two. The people weep and we weep. At the beginning of the gospel reading today, um, or at the beginning of my sermon today, I asked you to try and experience this. Not be a listener, but be part of the story of the passion of our Lord. I ask you to place yourself in Jerusalem and think about how you would have felt to participate in the parade of honor and within, and within days, the parade of shame. Now let's bring ourselves back to the present. How can we today continue to sing Hosanna? We will continue to sing praises for the beliefs and life situations that we agree with and pray for rather than ridicule those we do not. We understand this as love your neighbor. As we look to the future, we need to be conscious of our words and action towards God's creation. Isaiah tells us, who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. As a church, we use our ears to listen to the needs of the world and our tongues to speak for those who are unjustly harmed. In so doing, we see Jesus in the pain of our neighbors. The cross is about pain and suffering, all pain and suffering. Martin Luther's belief was this, through baptism we are free, slaves to none, and yet simultaneously servants to all. Hosanna to you all. Amen.